sing the opening hymn. Thank you. 
Testament lesson for the 14th Sunday after Pentecost is from Jeremiah chapter 15. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away, for know that for your sake I bear reproach. Your words were found and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone, because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Romans chapter 12. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of the Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So how is everybody this morning? Oh, this is loud. I have normally have a loud voice. <laughs> How's everybody this morning? Good. You know, while Pastor Andy is out hunting, he asked me to come over and tell you the story, um, today's Bible story. So that's what we're going to do. We talk about today's Bible story. But before we do that, we're going to play a game. Who wants to play a game? Raise your hand if you want to play a game. Okay, I'll take those ones back, sweetie. Close, close. Okay, we're going to play a game called follow the leader. I will be the leader. You will follow me. So you're going to, that means you're going to mimic me. So whatever I do, you do. And if you don't or you fall behind, guess what? You are out, out of the game. Okay? So everybody, please stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Everybody. Okay. Stand on one foot like a flamingo. Like that. Good. Uh... Tap your head. Rub your belly. Give yourself a hug. Shout hooray. Oh, come on. Shout hooray. Uh huh. Thank you. <laughs> good job. Okay, guys, sit down again. That was good. good. Good game. You know, I like to play follow the leader. You guys were really good sports. Even though you were, some of you were falling behind, I didn't say you were out. But I wasn't there because I was going too fast, right? Okay, anyhow, this game reminds me of today's Bible story. The story today is about following the leader. And that's, who is the true leader we follow? What? Jesus. God. God, Jesus. But this is how the story goes. Long time ago, when Jesus was here on earth, he was talking to his friends, his disciples. And you know what he told them? He told them that he was going to go and they were going to punish him, and then they were going to put him on a cross and kill him. And one of his best friends says, oh, no, 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 Lord, that will never happen to you. And Jesus said, hey, this must happen. 
his friend was thinking about right then what was going to happen, but Jesus was thinking about what was going to happen after that for the rest of mankind. You know what Jesus was talking about, about him go, carrying his cross, going to the cross, and you know what he did? And he did die. But you know the story, he did not stay dead. Three days later, he came back alive. And to this day, Jesus is alive. Yeah, he, he rose from the dead. And you know what? When he asked those guys, follow me, and you must, he said, if you want to follow me, you must pick up your cross. And he's telling us the same. So how do we follow Jesus? How do, what's that cross he's talking about? Yes, you are right. We follow Jesus. You know, willingly he went to the cross. Willingly he died because he loves us. He loves mankind. He loves God. He is obedient to his Father. This is how we follow Jesus, by being obedient to our Father, by willingly, and our, mom. our moms, and our parents, absolutely, and willingly help others, lo sacrifice. Some, sometimes we have to do some things that we don't want to do, but we have to do it for others, because this is what Jesus did. This has been, this has been follower of Jesus, being a follower of Jesus. You know, coming to church, Sunday school, all that's good. But it's not enough. It is good, but it's not enough. It doesn't mean that we're only going to be Christians for one Sunday for a couple of hours, and then we out the door and we forget who we are. That's not how it works. We are followers of Christ, so we are Christians here. And when we walk, walk out of the door, we are ready to do the same things that Jesus did. Love, forgive, help, and obedience. Obedient to his Father in heaven. Let's thank God. Shall we do? Okay, let's close our eyes. Dear Father, Dear Father thank, you thank you for forgiving us, for loving us, for giving us a Savior. Following him is hard. Give us a strength, wisdom. We ask for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, my friends. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a plumber, not a preacher. If you want to make God smile, tell him what you're going to do. I told Pastor Kalt many years ago that I would do the plumbing and he could do the preaching. But uh, here I am in 
Um, but as lay people, we, don't, we can't preach, but we're going to give a message. And the message I have today comes from uh, one of my favorite pastors. His name is um, Pastor uh, Reverend Dr. King Claus, and he was with the, uh, is with the uh, Lutheran Hour. And I'll, I'll read a little bit about him to begin with. Kenneth Richard Claus, son of blacksmith Richard and homemaker Jeanette, were, was born in Evergreen Park, Illinois in October of 1948. He was doubly blessed with a parochial education, doubly blessed because of the knowledge re received and because there he met his wonderful and God-given helpmate, Pamela. In August of 1970, they were married at their home church. Their marriage was blessed with three very special children. Kurt, who is married to Jody and is a pastor at Messiah Lutheran Church in Lakeville, Minnesota. Kirsten, a school teacher who is married to Jeff Lindzen in Chaska, Minnesota. And Christiana, who is an occupational therapist and married to James Bourne in Maybach, Texas. After he graduated from Springfield Seminary, he served as pastor in Edgemont and Hot Springs. Springs, South Dakota, Danville, Illinois, Lakefield and Chaska, Minnesota, and Dallas, Texas. For his work among the Lakota of Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, he was given a Native American name by the granddaughter of Chief Red Cloud. In 2002, he became Speaker of the Lutheran Hour, and during this time on the Lutheran Hour, stations increased from uh, under 800 to 1,380. In retirement, he continued to speak on that broadcast while daily devotions and writing da daily devotions and other publications. In December of 2005, he was awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree from Concordia University in Mequon, and in 2014 was selected as Alumni of the Year at that same institution. Preceded in death by his parents, Pastor was welcomed into heaven by his Savior on March 23, 2023. And then um, the uh, a reading from the Gospel lesson. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. It's the gospel of our Lord. So the, uh, his, the, this is a fa my favorite sermon that uh, I've, uh, the pastor uh, Claus preached, and I'm going to share that with you. And it's titled, Life Without Regrets. And it was presented on the Lutheran Hour, August 28, 2011, by Reverend Dr. Ken Claus, Speaker Emeritus of the Lutheran Hour. And he begins, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus has done all which is necessary to save us from an eternity of regrets. Today, through the Holy Spirit's power, the living Lord invites all who hear to believe on his sacrifices made for their salvation. May God grant such a faith to us all. Amen. Does the name Steve Bartman mean anything to you? No? How about if I add this information? Wrigley Field, October 14, 2003. Uh, that uh, lit up some light bulbs for the nation's diehard Cubs fans. Uh, 2003, the Cubs had a real actual chance of getting to the World Series. The last time they had been there was 1945, before I was born. The last time they brought home a, the pennant was 1908, when my grandfather was a young man. Now the Cubs were in game six of the National League championships. They were ahead in games three to two, and they were ahead in this particular game as well. A few more outs and they were headed for the big time. Luis Castillo of the Marlins was at bat. He hit a fly ball that went foul. 
Even so, the Cubs outfielder raced to get it. He almost jumped into the stands to get it. But fan Steve Bartman touched the, that ball. Castillo ended up walking and the Marlins collected seven runs before the inning was over. The Marlins won the, the game that day and the next as well. And Steve Bartman, a lifelong Cubs fan, for his own safety, he was escorted from the stands by a cordon of security. In the next days, the governor of Illinois suggested Bartman ought to get a new identity like they do in the witness protection plan, and the governor of Florida offered him asylum. As many as six Chicago police squad cars encircled his home to keep his house and family safe. And Steve Bartman, good husband, good little league coach, good guy, and good fan, Steve ended up writing an apology in which he said he, re he regretted what had happened and he was truly sorry. I'm sure he was. I'm sure Steve Bartman, if he had a chance to relive that day, would decide to act differently. Almost all of us have days like that. Days when we regret what we've done or what we should have done. Days when we wish we could have a do-over. Or days when we whisper to ourselves. If only I knew then what I know now. Days when we think, if I had a chance to do it over, I woulda, I shoulda, I coulda done things differently. Yes, I know Frank Sinatra sang a song, My Way, where he crooned regrets I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. When I first heard that song way back in 1969, I was impressed. I was impressed by a fellow who, no matter what, had done things his way and managed to do it without looking back or second-guessing himself. You know, as that song climbed the charts and, and as I listened more closely to the lyrics, I found myself concluding that I had little in common with Frank Sinatra. And yes, I know that's a pretty obvious fact to you, but back then I was young and foolish. The truth was, even back then I had regrets. Regrets that were too many to be mentioned. I have them still. As a pastor, I regret some of the sermons I've preached. As a counselor, I regret some of the advice I've given. And as a father, I regret the time I didn't spend with my children. And as a husband, I regret any time I took a wonderful helpmate for granted. Regrets? If I didn't come up with enough regrets of my own, I have others who will bring my shortcomings to my attention. It hasn't been so many years ago that one of my high school classmates showed up in my office. We had a wonderful visit for about a half an hour and then he came to the purpose for his having stopped by. He wanted to talk about mis he wanted to talk about the way I had mistreated him in high school. Mistreatment? What mistreatment? I didn't remember any mistreatment. Even if I didn't say those words out loud, that was what I was thinking. Well, my friend, and he is a friend, he began reciting a litany of things I had done, cruel things, callous things, hurtful things. It was true. I had hurt him, and I was ashamed. Yes, I have regrets more than a few. Now, I wouldn't have spent this much time talking about regrets if I wasn't pretty sure that you have a list of your own regrets. I can't tell you how many husbands and wives I've counseled where one, maybe both of them are saying, if I had only known before we got married what I know now, I never would have walked down the aisle with you. I can't recall how many depressed individuals I've spoken to who have said, if I had only taken that other job when it was offered, I never would have found myself in this financial predicament. Or, if only I checked on the baby one more time. Or I should have read the signs better. Maybe I could have stopped him from taking his life. Smokers have regrets about smoking. Drinkers regret their first sip of demon rum and gamblers wish they had never picked up a card. Now I'm not sure how far I have to go to touch upon or mention your very personal regret. Rather than making my guess or dig around in the dark, I hope you're willing to concede there are things you have done which you wish could be erased from your past. Days which you wish could be X'd off your calendar. 
things you have said which never should have been spoken, temptations you embraced which should have been avoided. If you admit to having regrets, I welcome you into a group which covers most of humanity. And as near as I can tell, almost everybody who is in the Bible. Really, that's not an exaggeration. Now, most folks would think about the people of Scripture, usually imagine those folks to be great heroes of faith, individuals who were a cut or two above the rest of us, folks who had to work hard before they were able to commit even the smallest of sins. We call those folks saints, and artists draw them with a halo around their heads. But quite frankly, they were entirely all that, weren't all, but quite frankly, they were not entirely all that good. These folks are in the Bible not because they're better than us. Their lives have been recorded because they are us. They have the same flaws and failings that we have. If you doubt me, take a look. Since in the beginning, Adam and Eve, did they not regret eating from the forbidden tree, introducing sin into God's perfect world, and losing the perfection of the garden which they had been given? Of course they regretted that what they had done. Their regrets, their regrets would have probably have sent them back if God hadn't placed a sword-carrying angel at the garden's entrance. Then there was Cain, whose jealousy of his brothers led to murder. Cain had some regrets, although they may have been only half-hearted. And Noah's celebration of having survived the flood led him to a rather embarrassing revelation. You see how it is? And I've only just begun. The children of Israel regretted murmuring against God because it meant they were going to die in the wilderness. Blind Samson regretted having a mouth which couldn't keep a secret. And David regretted his adultery and the murder at birth. In the New Testament, St. Paul regretted the time he had been actively involved in persecuting and murdering those who were part of Jesus' family of faith. Then there is Peter. Later generations were ven have venerated, respected, and honored the spokesman of the disciples. But the bottom line is this, Peter must have been the master of regret. And if you think I'm speaking too strongly, take a look at his record. Peter is the one disciple who asked for an invitation to walk on the water to the Savior. He gets permission, starts walking, and then his faith deserts him and he sinks. Peter is the fellow who, at the Last Supper, refuses to have Jesus wash his feet. And then he demands Jesus wash all of him. Peter is the follower who says he will never desert Jesus. And then he falls asleep when Jesus asks him to stay awake. And he went, runs away from the crowd which comes to rest the Savior. Peter is the disciple who bravely goes to the high priest courtyard to see what is happening at Jesus' trial. And there he denies ever having known the Savior. Peter is the one who gives one of the best statements of faith which can be found in the Gospels. And a few short verses later, he tries to convince Jesus that it really wasn't all that necessary for him to make a final trip to Jerusalem. Jesus, Jesus be, being the Father's all-knowing Son and having understood the Old Testament prophecies concerning his work, his life, and the extraordinary painful way he was destined to die, might well, if he had been one of us, embrace Peter's words. Jesus, if he had not been completely dedicated to saving you and I from eternal damnation, might have said, Wow, Peter, you know, I never thought of it that way. That's a fantastic idea. Tell you what, we'll just move our headquarters to another location, and there, with my ability to multiply loaves and fishes, we can live out our lives in peace and prosperity. Then Jesus, if he had been one of us, might have said, Peter, my number one buddy, you get an A for the day for having come up with that one. And that's what might have happened, but Jesus was de dedicated to saving us. He was committed to fulfilling the Father's plan to redeem us, and that meant, rather than praising Peter, Jesus spoke one of the most powerful reprimands which, is, which Scripture re records. 
Rather than getting a pat on the head for his great idea, Peter heard Jesus saying, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. No matter how you try to read that, it comes out strong. That day, Jesus' word came out strong, and they hit hard. Yes, I imagine years later, when Peter thought about that day, he had a certain amount of regret. Scripture tells us that Jesus then stopped speaking only to Peter and began addressing the rest of the gathered disciples. It's all right for you to listen in on what he said, since the Holy Spirit intends for you to hear the Savior's words. The Father wants all of his people to know just what it means to be a Christian. He wants us to know because it's easy for us, like Peter, to get it wrong. For example, present-day Christianity has come up with the idea that being a Christian is an easy thing. Many have concluded Christianity is a one-way street with God doing all the work. God has to be there for us. He has to listen to us, pay attention to our demands, and give us what we want. Many of us believe that we, not God, are sitting in the driver's seat. In the 16th chapter of Matthew, Jesus corrects that misconception. He starts out by saying something like, Look, boys, I don't want you to get down the road a bit and regret following me. I don't want you to say, If only Jesus had been honest with me, if only he had warned me, if only I knew what I know now, I would never have left my fishing nets or my tax collector's table or my political party or my vineyard. I want you to know what is in store for you. So here's the bottom line. If any man is coming after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Then Jesus continued. He continued because he knew any reasonable person would respond to his words saying, hold it, wait, in heaven's name, why should I, why would anyone take up a cross? Jesus continued and said, if you're going to save your life, you will lose it. And if you lose your life following me, you'll find it. At that point, the disciples probably turned to each other and said, what did he say? Losing? Binding? I don't get it. I wouldn't be surprised if they did say something like that. The words Jesus had just shared are hard enough to understand when you're looking at them on paper. But when somebody says them in passing, it might have left the disciples scratching their heads, which is why Jesus explained by asking, do you think a man is making a wise deal if he manages to make himself a big financial success, but in so doing, he manages to lose his soul? Jesus was asking his disciples and us, how can a person live his life, prioritize his life, and get to the end without regret? Jesus wanted to make sure that years later, when his students were being crucified, or speared, or stoned, or flayed, or clubbed because they were his first and foremost missionaries, they didn't look up to heaven and call out, Jesus, you didn't tell me this was part of the deal. That day, Jesus told them what the deal was, what the deal is. That day, Jesus told them they would have a cross if they followed him. Yes, they would have a cross, but in the end, they will also have a savior. They would have a savior who forgave them of all they had done wrong. They would have a savior who would defend them when they were judged. They would have Jesus, and in the end, that would be a relationship they would never regret. Of course, Jesus wanted them also to know there was an alternative to following him and carrying that cross. They could ignore him. They could forget about his forgiveness he was providing them. They could pass on the call to faith the Holy Spirit would extend. If they wished, they could live their lives all on their own without a single thought or consideration of eternity. Many people do that, you know. All there is, they say, is the here and now. I believe you live and you die and that's it, they proudly boast. In reply, Jesus says, God wants all men to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. But he isn't going to force you to follow Jesus and pick up a cross. If you want to live without Jesus, you can. 
Regret, this is a message about regret. Now you and I have done many things, said many things for which we are rightly regretful. But there is one regret which makes all the others appear to be downright minuscule in comparison. And that is the regret a person will have on Judgment Day if Jesus is not his Lord and Savior. Jesus referred to that ultimate regret when he asked, What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There will be desperation among the lost souls on Judgment Day. When those without Jesus realize the scriptures weren't joking, and everlasting hell is waiting for them. At that moment, they will not regret having turned down God. At that moment, will they have not regret having turned down God's gracious offer? Will they not regret the opportunities they have squandered? At that moment, what would they do to give their souls? Is there any price they would not pay to find themselves? translated to heaven's paradise and find themselves among the saved. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you give to avoid the day of ultimate regret? The answer is obvious, you'd give everything, but everything is not enough to complete the transaction. Everything doesn't even make a beginning. It is not enough because you don't have the ability or capability of ransoming your soul. If you depend on yourself to ransom your soul, judgment day is too late day. But now there is time. Now something can still be done to head off that, the regret. And if you're wondering what you can do, once again, the answer is you can't do anything. A sinner cannot save himself. A transgressor cannot cleanse his soul. And a spiritual beggar cannot find the price necessary to free himself from sin, death, and the devil. And it is here, precisely where a sinner is helpless to save his soul, we need the Savior. While we might give everything, Jesus did give everything. Everything is the price Jesus paid to rescue us. The Gospel of Matthew records how Jesus set aside Peter's urging to avoid Jerusalem. It tells how Jesus went and how he was arrested speaks of his trials conducted illegally based on lies and trumped up charges. It tells how Jesus gave everything, how he was beaten, spit upon, scourged, crowned with thorns, and then crucified. Jesus, who throughout his life had done only good, was crucified between two thieves. And there on the cross, having res resisted every temptation, having avoided every sin, Jesus gave everything to save our souls. What price can save our soul? Look to Calvary and the empty garden tomb and you'll find your answer. Yes, look to the open tomb and know the risen Christ is God's guarantee that all who believe will not perish but have everlasting life. The risen Redeemer is God's promise that for people of faith, on the day of judgment, they need not be afraid that past regrets no longer have meaning, nor are they valid. My friends, you may, in the course of your life, have many regrets. Following the Savior it will not be one of them. He has done all which is necessary to save us. He has done all which is necessary to forgive and bring us into the family of faith. He has done all so we might be ready someday to leave this world so that we may be sure of God's great grace as shown in the Savior. I extend this invitation. If you need to know more about him, please, won't you call us at the Lutheran Hour? And then I would also ask, call on Zion's pastors and on Zion's lay, lay leaders to more about our Lord and Savior. Amen.
We delight ourselves in him, even in the difficulties of life. Together, let us give voice to our constant prayers. Heavenly Father, you alone have the power to redeem your enemies and make them friends. In the mercy of Jesus, who has claimed us as his own, enable us to show love to our enemies, keeping your grace upon them, as you have loved us even though we never deserve it. Help us to do the same to others in our lives, in your love, O oh Lord. Help us to love you who have first loved us. Lord Jesus, our hearts delight in your goodness despite the evil of this fallen world. You entered into our midst because of your mission to seek and save the lost. We join with you in this mission, Lord, commissioned by your gospel to make known among the nations what you have done. Restore us, renew us, and lead us. We delight in the new life you have given to all who trust in you, in your joy, O Lord. Help us to rejoice in all things. Spirit of truth, you resuscitate what is dead, mend what is broken, and overcome what is evil with the goodness found only in you. Turn us again and again to your mercy that we, having received it from you, may then extend it to others. Work mightily through each of us in our vocations at church, home, work, and society. Fill the hearts and minds of all who need your wisdom and discernment, equipping them for the challenges they face. Through it all, instill in us your peace to guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In your peace, O Lord, help us to be peacemakers. Be near to those who are broken in heart, body, and mind. Comfort the lonely and renew the spirit of those who despair. Clothe the naked and shelter the homeless. Let those who walk through the desert of difficulty discover the oasis of your living water. Hear the prayers we offer for those in our family of faith who need your healing mercies. We lift up before you prayers of comfort and peace for Rosemary Sternbeck and family as they mourn the loss of her son. For Delaine Jensen as she mourns the loss of her brother and her brother-in-law. Pray for healing for Linda Gronwald who will be having surgery in the coming week. For Matthew Olson who had heart surgery and is recovering. For Leslie Corvola's daughter who is suffering health issues. For Jason Greer as he awaits a transplant. For Kim Carlson who is diagnosed with cancer. Pray for Brother Rua, who is recovering from a fall. We offer prayers of thanksgiving for Corey Boffler, who is doing well, and for Steve Malcott in his recovery. We give prayers of thanksgiving for Michael and that holy baptism. And we pray for all of those who have we have brought before you. <clears throat> Your caring love for us is genuine and eternal. In your care, O oh Lord, help us to care for others. To you, gracious Father, be all the glory, honor, and praise in Christ Jesus and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. We sing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.